shopping and then mm. came back on my walker. Well, we'll start anyway. So <laughs> Don't because... ask me any questions. My brain is gone by <laughs> okay. Um This is George Washington's perfect. Well, before I, let me introduce myself. Yeah. My name is Evan Weiner. Uh, I've been in radio and in TV oh, cool. and did magazines and newspapers starting in 1971 in Spring Valley, New York. And uh, today is George Washington's birthday. George Washington would be today uh, 200 and uh, minus 13, 287 years old. Oh. 287. That's not bad. Not a bad ride. 287 years old. And uh, we are celebrating, or we celebrated President's Week on Monday. And uh, right here, Mary jo. one thing that, uh, go ahead, <laughs> one thing that uh, you probably haven't been taught very much in the history books is about Barbados and Barbados' role in American history. I haven't now, heard that before. Uh -uh. Yeah, Barbados plays a significant role in American history with George Washington, who would have been 287 years old, and Thomas Jefferson. But before I go on with Washington, I'm going to start with, there's the Washington Monument, of course. I'm going to start in Barbados in 1649. The English Civil War spills out to Barbados. The king loses his head. Cromwell takes over, the Loyalists leave, and the, some of the Loyalists end up in Barbados, which is a British colony. It's British? And, and Barbados was a British colony. And yeah, Barbados, but what is it now? Right now it's an independent country. Oh, okay. But Barbados was uh, the British colony. In fact, it was the crown jewel in the Americas. Mm. Uh, it is there where the British Navy is. It is there where the money is. Uh, and it is there as the center of the slave trade. Barbados is the first, Barbados was first visited by the Portuguese. They looked at the place and we don't want any part of it, but they did give Barbados their name because there were a lot of bearded men there. So the English come in later on about 1625, 1626, and they set up shop. By 1649, there's an English civil war and Cromwell takes over, uh, the Loyalists flee, and they go to Barbados. The war spills out to Barbados, and the Loyalists put up a fight. And basically, it's a blockade, and the British Navy can't get there. And this starts about 1651, and it goes through the end of 1651 into 1652. Cromwell is in power. The royalists who supported King Charles went to Barbados because they didn't want to lose their property, or more importantly, they didn't want to lose their head because they may have had their heads chopped off. Uh, so they buy this property or get property in Barbados, and they're basically the people who are running Barbados. Now, the English come in, and they want to do things like impose tax on the Barbadans, the former royalists. And they have a problem. Anyway, the Civil War spills over. Um, the Royal Navy tries to take on the locals. They're defeated. Eventually, in the town of Osteens, in January of 1652, the charter of Barbados is signed. The local loyalists, or the people who used to be the loyalists, who are now the Barbadians, basically were fighting and said, hey, look, you cannot tax us without representation. We do not want taxation without representation. 1651, 1652. Where would you hear that again? Taxation without representation. In the United States. Well, before the United States. It wasn't quite the United States. So the Charter of Barbados was agreed upon on January 11th, ratified at a bar. Where else are you going to ratify a treaty but at a bar, right? The Mermaid Tavern in Osteens. On January 17, 1652, there are 23 articles in this charter. They had Among bars them, back there then? They had bars. The English really? had bars. You know, the English always liked uh, their taverns. Uh, they, there are 23 articles in this 
particular charter of Barbados, including addressing religious liberties, that's Article 1, free trade, Article 2, taxation, taxation, no taxation without representation. This is a Barbados idea that eventually would come down. And uh, the authority of a local assembly to put laws in. So the Civil War and the Charter of Barbados, they're done, January 17, 1652. And it's this sign that got me interested. This is a picture I took of this sign. This sign is in Bridgeport, rather Bridgetown, Barbados. And if you go on cruise ships, and I've been through Barbados on cruise ships because I speak on cruise ships, uh, when you get into port, and if you're the farthest ship, and generally the ships I've been on have been in the farthest part of the port, uh, you can take a bus in or you can walk a half mile. The problem is walking a half mile, it's 95 degrees with 95% humidity. So you got to make your choice. You, you either walk back or take the bus. So we decided one day, let's take the bus back because it was so hot. And there are all kind of little signs like this in the port. You know, rum, molasses, and then, oh, wait a minute. From this vantage point, you can witness one of the naval theaters of the English Civil War, 1642 through 51. Sir George Askew commanded a naval blockade of the island of Barbados from his ship, the Rainbow, in Osteen's Bay from October 1651 to January 1652. Askew's naval forces were set to subdue loyal royalists led by the governor, Lord Willoughby. The stalemate ended in the treaty between royalists and parliamentary sections after the final conflict in Osteen's. The Charter of Barbados signed 11 January 1652 at the Mermaid Tavern in Osteen's. It guaranteed Barbadian colonists their rights to land, local control of taxation, liberty of conscience, access to courts of law, and limited free trade. All of which ends up in what? The Declaration of Independence. So Thomas Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson finds out from somebody about this treaty. We do not know who he finds out from about this treaty, but the treaty basically says, no taxes, customs, imports, loans, or excise shall be laid nor levied made on any inhabitants of the island without the consent of the General Assembly. Article 3 of the Charter of Barbados signed in the Mermaid Tavern, which is no longer there, uh, in, at Ostens, in uh, Ostens, rather, January 17, 1652. The original Tea Party might have been in Barbados. The Declaration of Independence might have been lifted from this. We don't know. I gave this talk in uh, Glen Rock, New Jersey about a month ago to a bunch of historians and most people had no idea but there was one person who said my roommate in college did a paper on Jefferson and the Declaration of Independence and yes the Declaration of Independence may have been the work of somebody else, not Thomas Jefferson. So, the Boston Tea Party started where? Well, you could argue the Tea Party started in Barbados. The Mermaid Tavern in Ostanes was the site of the final battle between the Royalists and the Roundheads. They signed the Charter. The Articles of Rendition of the Island from Proprietary Rights to Commonwealth Parliament. All of this is done on January 11, 1652, Barbados would go on to become the crown jewel of the British American Empire. The money was there. It was the largest area of English-speaking people at the time in 1652. Slave trade is going on. Sugar trade is going on. Financing going on. So Barbados had an awful lot of things to do. The treaty basically was this. Barbados accepted the authority of the English Parliament, but this is what they got returned. Uh, local taxes could not be raised without local consent. What was the whole problem in the United States? Well, it wasn't the United States in the southern colonies in the 1760s. 
1770s, taxes. No representation. There is representation in Barbados. And uh, this is one of the signs that you see when you go to the port where it talks about the Treaty of Ostens. And um, I won't read the whole thing, but I will read its concept. No taxation without representation was the inspiration for the Boston Tea Party in 1773 and subsequently included in the American Declaration of Independence. Yes? I, this is very interesting. I don't want to miss it. There's but, but Jefferson. Can you tell somebody back there? Quiet them. Uh, I can't. Somebody else can't know. Anyway, uh, this is Jefferson. This is the Jefferson Memorial in Washington. And there is no mention of the Treaty of Osteen's within the Jefferson Memorial and the little museum that's there. But Thomas Jefferson may have, as we would call it, pinched a little bit of the treaty to put it into the Declaration of Independence. <laughs> the charter probably influenced the American Declaration of Independence. George Washington came to Barbados in 1751 as a 19-year-old. And some historians are under the impression that George Washington learned all about the charter during his little time in Barbados. George Washington only left mainland North America once in his life. It was in 1751. And the reason he left, his brother Lawrence was suffering from tuberculosis. And the thought of that time, the prevailing thinking of that time was, George goes, or rather Lawrence goes, George goes with him and tries to recover from tuberculosis in the heat, in the humidity, and also one of the Washington relatives, Gedney Clark, has a place in Barbados where they can stay. So George goes. Uh, Lawrence Washington's wife did not want to go. She had small kids. She lost a couple kids in childbirth, stillborn. And um, nobody wanted to go with Lawrence, so here's 19-year-old George, gets on the boat, and he decides to go with his half-brother. Um, he agrees to go, and Washington kept all kind of diaries. Uh, the brothers sailed on a ship called the Success, which was a very small ship. It took about six weeks to go from where they were in Virginia to Bridgetown. It takes about three days to do that now on a cruise ship. Washington doesn't seem to be too thrilled about being in this boat or being on the Atlantic Ocean, which he called Fickle, in the merciless ocean. And this is where they stayed. It's still there. It's next to the resort. I think it's a Sandals resort. It looks like today's property. Yeah, it is today's property. It has been there forever and ever and ever. It's been there for at least maybe as close to 400 years since George went uh, there. Uh, well, probably from 1751. I'm talking about 270 years ago, so maybe 300 years or so, something like that. So this is where he stayed. And before he got there, Washington recorded all kinds of stuff in his diary. Details about sailing, the fish they caught, tried to get. Dolphin, pilot fish, shark. Barracudas, tiger fish. They dock on November 2nd, 1751, and George is rather reluctant to go to the Clark house because Mrs. Clark has smallpox. And that's the last thing that he wants, smallpox. He was not greeted by this sign, although he was right there in Carlisle Bay. And uh, Carlisle Bay is surrounded by 200 meter deep uh, shelf. Uh, there are reefs there and you can go swimming there and all kind of stuff takes place there and all kind of stuff took place when George was there. But I doubt that he was greeted with this sign, Carlisle Bay. The English settled Barbados in 1627. Two decades later, by 1650, Barbados was its crown jewel in North America or British America. Sugar became king. Barbados was one of the most precious colonial possessions. Bridgetown, where the Washingtons ended up, 
was one of the most popular city in British America. Gedney Clark was Lawrence Washington's uncle. Washington did not want to go in the house because Mrs. Clark had smallpox. Within two weeks, George Washington got smallpox, which turned out to be very fortunate for him 25 years later fighting in the Revolutionary War. Within two weeks, he gets the disease. He recovers. And he's taken in by the British Navy. The British Navy somehow found George Washington, or George Washington found the British Navy. And they liked George. They liked him so much that they showed him everything about their Navy, about their military, about how to protect the island, about their military tactics. He knew everything he needed to know from his little state in Barbados, the only time he left North America. He would end up going back eventually, in a few weeks. He concluded, after looking at the island, that he was not a military man, at least he wasn't a military man when he got to Barbados, he concluded that Barbados was one entire, I-N-T-I-E-R, entire fortification. And Washington becomes enthralled with the military. Uh, chances are that's what George, kind of what George saw. They had the wall around Barbados with the weaponry. And uh, of course, this is today's picture. It's not a picture from when Washington was there. Everything's been restored. But Washington fell in love with the military. They go back home, the brothers, half brothers. Lawrence Washington would die of tuberculosis in July of 1752. George would take over the house, but George also decided he wanted to do something else. After all, he was in colonial Virginia. He had never seen a place with as many people as Bridgetown in Barbados. He never met the kind of people that he did in Barbados. These were influential people. These were people that he would keep up with with the rest of his life. George Washington's stay in Barbados was brief, but rather important. And you never learned about it in school, did you? They never talk about Washington and Barbados. One place where you can find out about Washington and Barbados is at the Mount Vernon home down in Virginia. So he uh, goes back to Virginia, and he decides, I'm going to advance my military career and I am going to get, be the head of the militia in Virginia eventually. I want to get in the action. And the action is coming because the French-Indian War is only a couple of years away. George saw the commission in the British military. Um, the ambition may have been prompted by his time in Barbados. George never did go to England to get a proper education. His father had died. So there was no money, so he was in Virginia. So this was a big deal for him going to Barbados. In December of 1752, Washington, without any military experience, is made commander of the Virginia militia. He is 20 years old. One thing about George Washington, George Washington was six foot four. He was tall, he was strong, he stood out because people were short in those days, and he was ahead. Uh, above, head and shoulders, literally in height, above most other people. He would see action in the French and Indian War. One thing about George Washington, he may have been a great leader, but he was miserable on the battlefield. He wasn't all that good on the battlefield. Uh, I know you're from Pittsburgh, because we've talked about you being from Pittsburgh. Who, who helped establish the city of Pittsburgh? You know? Who are you talking to? Yeah, Bill. 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 Did you who? Who? I, I can't hear. Oh, you. okay. I'm sorry. I only get a little bit of what you. Oh, okay. I t I know you're from Pittsburgh, and I want to know who's one of the people who helped establish the city of Pittsburgh. Establish what? City of Pittsburgh. Who established? Who established the city of Pittsburgh? I don't know. I I think you got the wrong guy. But he's from Pittsburgh. He's not. Oh, I thought you were. Oh, okay. Not a historian. Oh, okay. Anyway, anyway, George Washington was one of the founders of the city of Pittsburgh. Uh, he did see action. The French and Indian War is eventually put in charge of all of the militia forces of Virginia. 
1753, George Washington is 21 years old. He's sent as an ambassador from the British Crown to French officials to meet with Indians as far north as Erie, Pennsylvania, which didn't exist in those days. So George Washington, by the time he's 21, is identified as a big-time operator and leader. And he needs to go to meet with French officials to see if they can quell a war between England and France in North America. So he goes to meet with them and Indians to no avail. Uh, they couldn't work anything out. In 1754, he goes to where Pittsburgh, or is supposed to go to where Pittsburgh is to help build a fort on the three rivers in Pittsburgh. But before reaching that point, he's ambushed by the French. The leader is killed. Washington is captured. He finally is freed after his surrender. He's released on parole and he goes back to Virginia. He becomes a surveyor, gets involved in military again, English, and is in the middle of the French and Indian War, which starts in 1756. But George Washington gets into disagreements. But before he gets into disagreements, he had shaped the Virginia militia into one of the best military units in the colonies. And he was a tough guy. He was a really tough guy. Uh, he enforced discipline. He punished his troops, sometimes with lashes. If the troops escaped, went AWOL, captured them, desertion, he hung them. He had no problems with that. George became a tough military guy. But he wasn't very good on the battlefield. That was a problem. He gets into fights with the governor of uh, Virginia, who was appointed by the British, Robert Dimwitty. And he says, OK, I've had enough. He resigns from the militia at the end of his military career, roughly about 1757. And he goes home. He goes home. That's it. I'm out of here. I'm going to go back to the plantation and I'm going to run the plantation. January 6, 1759, he marries Martha. Martha was a rich widower with a couple of kids. He becomes a politician, a member of the Virginia House of Burgesses. Between 1759 and 1777, George Washington is both a politician and a plantation owner, complete with slaves. And that should be it. It should be the end of George Washington. We should not hear anything else after this. He's 27 years old, and he goes back and he runs his, his land. Meanwhile, while he's home, he's missing all the action, which he probably, from what I've read, would not have been adverse to be in. This is Quebec City, and this is where life in North America changes, 1759 on the plains of Abraham. English and French are at war again, this time in North America. The English want to keep Canada. The French have a lien on Canada, Quebec City, Nova Scotia. So there is the Battle of Quebec City. Uh, if you've been to Quebec City, the St. Lawrence Seaway comes in. There's Lower Quebec City. There's Upper Quebec City. Upper Quebec City has a wall mostly around it, not all of it. Um, there's cliffs on the side. They decided not to finish the wall. This is where the decisive battle would take place. Uh, this talks about, O oh, Canada, this glorious national anthem verse um, about the battle, Plains of Abraham. And there's the wall, and the wall ends. And there's a cliff. In the French field, they're safe by the cliff. Nobody is going to come up that cliff. We'll be able to defend the Plains of Abraham and Quebec City. Well, they're thinking we're slightly wrong. In the Shroud of Fog, the English come up St. Lawrence Seaway, the St. Lawrence River, and they go to the exact spot where the cliffs start. And the British come up the cliffs, capture, and they catch the French soldiers by surprise in General Montcalm, and they kill Montcalm 15 minutes after the battle starts uh, in September on the 13th. 
1759, it says Montcalm defeated here, and here it says he's killed in French. And that's it. British get Quebec City. They get control of most of Canada. Quebec would end up having special rights. Now, meanwhile, in Nova Scotia, in 1759, the British under uh, James Wolfe, who was the general, besieged Quebec City for three months, and he defeats uh, Montcalm. Meanwhile, and there's uh, the Plains of Abraham today. Rather peaceful looking place, right? Chateau Frontenac behind there. And there's the St. Lawrence Seaway, and you can see if there was fog, these guys could come right up this way and take the city, and they did. Uh, meanwhile, anybody here read Evangeline? The poem. I had to read that in school. I think it was in fifth grade. Nova Scotia, 1605, the French colonists established the first permanent European settlement in the future Canada in Nova Scotia at Port Royal, which would become Acadia. Um, Louisbourg was the crown jewel of the French, the biggest French settlement in Nova Scotia, 1713. It had the biggest military fortress. It fell in 1758. It's another part of the story that Washington missed. The Treaty of Utrecht in 1713 gave Cape Britain and Prince Edward Island to the French. They hung on as long as they could. This is a replica of the fort in Louisbourg that the English sacked. Captured the French, took the French, sent the French men to a little island in Halifax. If you survived the island, the French would redistribute you. Some of the people were de redistributed to the Louisiana Territory, which is why the United States has Cajun culture today. It was these people who ended up in Louisiana that became the American Cajuns in Louisiana. And was that building built in the 1700s? This building is, was built in the 1960s. It's oh, a replica. Okay. Uh, it's oh, a okay. one-fourth size because there, was no, there were no jobs up there. And the government said, we got to get these people to work because the mines were all gone, everything was all gone. So they built this. It's a quarter of the size that it was, and they, they run shows there. That thing was completely demolished. Some of it reconstructed. And Longfellow, Longfellow wrote Evangeline about the exile of the French and how some of the French ended up in Louisiana. And it's about a woman who loses her lover and she can't find them. And uh, it's a poem about that. And that's the lighthouse up there that the French built. And if you walk through Halifax, there's a monument to the French who were displaced. Some of them went like that to Louisiana. Some of them went to other colonies. But uh, there's a monument, kind of like, oh, we're kind of sorry that we practice genocide, uh, and that's in the Halifax port. French and in, in, uh, the French and Indian War was a war that uh, England finally beat the French, and they took over land in Canada, through the Mississippi, Great Lakes Line, and the English took all of Canada, and gave Quebec some special rights to practice the French language. Washington never got his commission. Uh, he was the commander of uh, all the forces uh, in defense of Her Majesty's colony in Virginia. So he goes home. English is done. They're done. No wars. 1763, there's finally peace at hand in England. And here comes the problem. Somebody's got to pay the debt on all the wars that England had had in the previous 50 years. And what? where else can we find the money? Oh, we know. The colonists, the northern colonists and the southern colonists, will go after them. We need the money. Treaty of Paris ends the war in 1763, and Parliament turns its attention to the empire, particularly the colonies in North America. The debt had to be paid. The south, the southern colonists, know that the best troops are out of Canada, what is Canada now, 
They know England has won in Quebec. They chased the French out of Nova Scotia. They know that the best troops are gone. And there are some openings for them for independence. So, yes? Can we close the door back there? They're, they're leaving. They're leaving. Yeah. 1763, Parliament, the English Parliament, issues the proclamation of 1763. This is what gets George Washington, starts getting him very upset. The proclamation of 1763 prohibited settlements in the American colonies west of the Appalachians. George wanted to move out that way. The proclamation is greatly resented in Virginia. Where is Washington living? In Virginia at that point. 1765, the English Parliament imposes the Stamp Act for taxing the American colonies. That's where Patrick Henry gained some fame. Uh, he introduces the Stamp Act Resolves in the Virginia House of Burgesses. These resolves challenge Britain's right to impose a tax. This is 113 years after the Barbados, Barbados people, Barbadians, decided they didn't want the English to impose any tax on them. 1766, Parliament repeals the Stamp Act but passes the Declaratory Act, which asserts Great Britain's right to pass any laws governing the American colonies. 1767, Parliament imposes the Townsend duties taxing imports of tea, glass, paper, lead, and paint in the American colonies. And George Washington is getting furious at this point. He probably knows that the best troops are gone. They're elsewhere around the world. And he is beginning to think that maybe being in, in this marriage with England may not be all that good. By the late 1760s, Washington had experienced firsthand the effects of rising taxes imposed on the colonists by Britain and came to believe that it would be in the best interest of the colonists to declare their independence from England. This is the late 1760s. He says, let's get out of here. And of course, in Massachusetts, they're saying the same thing. Let's get out of here. Virginia, Massachusetts. Virginia was a powerhouse in those days. Tobacco and other crops. Massachusetts, of course, was the intellectual cradle of America at that point. Uh, in, 16, in 1767, Washington opposed the 